Thank you, Mary. Um, I must apologize to the audience. I woke up this morning with full laryngitis. I've been nursing it until now. And you might imagine it was because I was screaming and yelling when the Raptors were playing. And you would be right. <laughs> and you would be right. Um, it is such a joy for me to be with you, um, Essie. In my lifetime passion for books, it is still just an amazement to me, and I am in awe of people who can somehow create these words, string them together into what is, as Mary has noted, truly a magical story that makes us soar. So thank you. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for agreeing to come here. And I'm so glad to be on a stage with you again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have, I do have some w questions that I'm just dying to ask on behalf of the audience. What we'll do is I will ask some questions and we'll give you a chance to ask some questions. But at first I thought it would be lovely if Essie just read a little tiny bit for those of you who have not yet had the joy of opening the covers of this book. Essie, will you read a bit? I will, yes, and, and thank you all for coming, and um, I'd like to thank Heather and uh, Mary and everyone involved with the festival for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. So I'll just read a, a short passage, and for those of you who know nothing about the book, it's about um, an 11 or 12 year old field slave in Barbados who gets plucked out of his circumstances uh, just by chance and goes out into the greater world to find his place. All my childhood, I'd had no one, only Big Kit, as she was known in the cane. I loved her and I feared her. I was around five years old when I angered the quarters woman and was sent to live in the brutal hut below the dead palm tree, Kit's hut. On my first evening there, my supper was stolen and my wooden bowl cracked. I was struck hard on the side of my head by a man I did not know, so that I staggered and couldn't hear. Two little girls spat on me. Their ancient grandmother held me down with her talons biting into my arms and cut my handmade sandals from my feet for the leather. That was when I first heard Big Kit's voice. Not this one, she said softly. That was all. But then, some monstrous charge of dark energy, huge and inexorable as a breaker, poured towards us and picked the old woman up by the hair as though she were a boneless scrap of rag, tossing her aside. I stared, terrified. Big Kit just glared down at me with her orange eyes, as if disgusted, and then returned to her stool in the dark corner. But in the morning, I found her squatting beside me in the pale light. She offered her bowl of mash, traced the lines in my palm. You will have a great big life, child, she murmured. Life of many rivers. And then she spat in my hand and closed my fist so that the spit ran between my knuckles. That is first river right there, she said, starting to laugh. I adored her. She towered over everyone, huge, fierce. Because of her size and because she was a saltwater, a witch in old Dahomey before being taken, she was feared. She would sow curses into the dirt beds under the huts. Rooks would be found eviscerated, hanging in doorways. For three weeks, she forcibly took food from a strong smith's apprentice each morning and night, and she ate it in front of him, scooping with her fingers from his bowl until some understanding was reached between them. In the smoldering fields, she would glisten as if oiled, tearing up the wretched earth, humming strange songs under her breath, her flesh rippling. Some nights in the huts, she would murmur in her sleep in the low, thick language of her kingdom and cry out. No one ever spoke of that, and in the fields the next day, she would be all scorched fury, like a blunt axe, wrecking as much as she reaped. Her true name, she once told me, was Nawi. She had had three sons. She had had one son. She had had no sons, not even a daughter. Her stories changed with the moon. I remember how, some days at sunrise, 
She would sprinkle a handful of dirt over her blade and murmur some incantation, her voice husky, as though overcome with emotion. I loved that voice. It's rough music. She would suck air through her teeth and squint up her eyes and begin, when I was royal guard at Dahomey, or after I crushed the antelope with my hands like this, and I would stop whatever task was at hand and stand listening in wonder. For she was a marvel, witness to a world I could not imagine beyond the reach of the huts and the vicious fields of faith. All right, thanks. So beautiful. Essie, Essie, much has been written in contemporary literature of the experience of blacks in slavery. In your incredibly unique way, you have returned to this territory to tell a story which is at once rich, deep, and intimate. What inspired you to return to this narrative? Yeah, so I had initially thought I was writing an entirely different novel. Um, I thought I was writing about the Tichborne claimant series of trials, which was this uh, very infamous cause célèbre back, um, they ran from the 1860s to the 1890s uh, in England. And they centered around the disappearance of a young man called Roger Tichborne, who was the scion of an extremely wealthy um, family of landed aristocrats. And uh, when he was shipwrecked off the coast of Argentina, uh, he was presumed dead. And his mother refused to, to believe this. And she put notices in papers all around the world and got a response from a man in Australia claiming to be her son. And what, uh, just by chance, one of the family servants had retired to Australia, so she asked him to go and make the identification. And this man was called Andrew Bogle, and he was an ex-slave um, from a plantation in Jamaica, actually. And he had been stolen off that plantation by a member of the Tichborne household. So I thought this was so fascinating, and that I was going to write a, you know, this multi-layered story around that trial. And then, and then me being me, uh, of course, things started to go you know, awry immediately. And I, I found that I didn't want to stick to that story with its many different twists and turns and its absurdities. And, and I found I was much more interested in the psychology of a person who was like Bogle, but who wasn't actually Bogle himself, who had been raised in a place of great brutality and would have had a very uh, sharply... Uh, I guess, finite sense of his life and its possibilities and a sense that he would die young uh, and probably in a very brutal way. Uh, to be taken out of that kind of um, mentality and then transported into the greater world and into places that he could never have imagined, I, this is my material, I thought. Which is exactly what happened to Wash. Um, there were so many times in the book when the intense hurt the, the, the cruelty that was being described literally made me suck in my breath. Like, <gasps> the slave strung up and beaten in the field, wash when he was burned by the cloud cutter when it explodes. Can you share a little of what you are thinking and feeling as a writer when you begin to shape these scenes? And how do they carry the story along? How do you want them to carry the story along? Well, there is was... lots of brutality. Yeah, there's a lot of brutality, um, but it was very hard um, because obviously you have to research deeply when you're writing a novel like this, uh, which means confronting all of these horrible punishments and um, just the most outlandishly uh, brutal ways in which uh, people were, were punished and how kind of circumscribed their lives were. And that was very difficult reading um, and, and then very difficult to have to reproduce on the page. But I felt very much that I had to be um, as faithful to that uh, as possible and to depict these things in the book and not just sort of glance over them. Uh, both because I think that we don't really have um, a true sense of of what those lives looked like uh, on a daily basis uh, on plantations, and in particular in the Caribbean. I think we have maybe um, a stronger sense, uh, just through popular culture, of, of what you know, slavery might have looked like uh, on American plantations. Uh, but for me, it was an education um, to learn about 
uh, I guess, how slavery manifested itself, uh, in particular in Barbados. And I understood when I was writing that um, he's on the plantation in the very outset of the novel. And so as a writer, you know that you're beginning the novel in a very brutal way and in a way that's probably going to be shocking and upsetting to readers. And that readers are going to have to trust you enough to, um, to know that you're going to pull them through that, that brutal place. And I just had to you know, really hope that readers would, would do that. Because um, I think of the novel as being a sort of post-slavery narrative. Uh, there's only, I think, about a third of it that takes place on the plantation. I was much more interested in the notion of, of this idea of uh, living a life in freedom and what that actually means. And the fact that just because you are physically free, you're not necessarily um, unchained in your mind. You're not necessarily able to cast off uh, everything that has happened to you before that. And also... Um, Physically, uh, as a black man and as a disfigured black man, uh, there are limitations to his freedom of passage through the societies that he's going to be confronting uh, as he makes his way into the world. And so that was really the novel's subject, is the life afterwards, after. like what happened after. So it just, after. Sets, just set the context. From your point of view, it yeah. just set the context. Yes. The relationship between Wash and Titch are at the very core of this story. Did you know when you started where you wanted it to go? I often wonder, um, and over the years, having interviewed so many writers, some who say they have a whole arc of a story and they have to figure out how to get from the beginning to the end, and others um, who say, you know, I just keep asking myself questions like, what would happen? What would happen? Where would it go? And I'm curious when you wrote this, how the story unfolded for you in your mind and on the page. Yeah, so I'm somebody who makes very clear outlines of where I'd like to go in a book and, and what's going to happen. And then almost immediately I start deviating from this and it's, you know, it's like I can't color within the lines. Uh, but I know that I'm going to do that. I know that the story that I end up with is not going to look anything like uh, like this outline, but I need the roadmap just to convince myself that I have a sense of of where things are going because I couldn't work um, feeling like I was groping in the dark. So um, this the is a characters. Novel. Each of the characters um, they start in an outline, or just one day you decide uh, Erasmus's brother is going to stop in and he become a. a factor in the story and he's going to hire somebody who's going to uh, become the bounty hunter. Do, they, do the characters sort of emerge as you're... They emerge as I'm writing. I start with the idea of the central character, so Washington, um, and I have a very strong sense of who that character is from the outset, mm -hmm. but all of the, the sort of, I guess, supporting characters, I have no idea who these people are. Um, even somebody like Titch, he was ever shifting as I was writing. He wasn't one constant thing. Um, and his, his um, I guess, mutability was something that emerged as I was writing it. And I had no idea that there was going to be a bounty hunter or even that cousin Philip was going to come to visit. These are things that I just felt my way through and, and towards. And ultimately I did probably about 10 drafts of this book. Uh, most of which was actually discarding huge chunks of material. I, the second half of the book, I, I must have rewritten like seven times and just thrown it out. Like, I'm not somebody who reshapes old material. Like, I feel like, okay, I've got to start so afresh. If it's just not to, working. If it's not working, it just goes straight into the... Take it somewhere yeah. else. Mm -hmm. I can imagine, and we can imagine how demanding, because in the end... It feels so resolved, and every character feels so authentic to the story, uh, so beautifully done, really. Um, it felt to me that Titch, though he cared about Wash, he definitely cared about him enough that he wanted to remove him from the chance um, of being killed. Um, so he wanted to whisk him away from danger, but he never really saw Wash as the person equal to himself. I also felt that through the story. Um, Wash kind of latches onto him as a father figure, but 
Titch doesn't quite embrace him as a son, or if he does, there's some complexity to it. Um, he saves him only to abandon him. And so did you mean for this relationship to be ultimately so unfulfilling for them both? It's as if they both carried a past into it and couldn't connect? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I love that question because that is the central um, question of the novel and the relationship in the novel. Um, the fact that these two men are so ultimately very like-minded and very brilliant and um, sharing so many interests and gifts, but that in the end, the circumstances of, of uh, where they come from and the circumstances of the world in 1830s England and abroad uh, was such that they can never actually be equals, that this will never be a relationship of of um, two like-minded people who are on the same level. And I think Washington, you know, he's very young. He doesn't understand. He, he thinks that ultimately, uh, you know, he will always be with Titch and that they will have, um, he will continue to have this friendship into his adulthood. Uh, but I think Titch has a, an awareness that, that no, Washington actually isn't his equal and will never be his equal uh, even when he, he becomes a man and that's just the way of the world uh, even though he sees his gifts and he appreciates them. Right. Um, last night when we were uh, at the, the opening event last night Madeline Miller was so eloquent in expressing how um, writing and in particular fiction has at, it, has at its core the ability to make us feel things to build on our empathy mm. to expand that sense of understanding and I, I was th I felt this so much in the book and even when I thought about um, coming here today that Titch learns very quickly that Wash has real talent and through the story you raise this powerful notion that there are all these people in the world with innate talent and intelligence but whose skin color a place of birth uh, economic situation some combination just where they're born, where they're born, and what happens to them, um, that all that potential will go unrealized, fully unrealized, untapped. And I do wonder the extent to which you deliberately mean to hold this up as a mirror to us, because this is such a critical time for that. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It was... Um you know, from the outset of the novel, when I thought I was writing about the Tichborn story, this was not at all something that I was um, thinking of. But as the material started to shift and, and change its shape, um, I realized that uh, because of the initial drafts, Washington wasn't uh, a brilliant illustrator or a scientist. This wasn't something that was, um, you know, one of his, his talents. And as he gained those talents, I really started to think about how many lives were lost uh, of people who, who must have been, you know, you know, who possessed certain talents, but we'll never know about these talents. That they were never given the chance to exercise their, their gifts and and their genius, and and we'll never know about this, uh, simply because of, you know, the the horrible, awful um, circumstances of, of. Um, of slavery, of transatlantic slavery, like we'll we'll never know how much was lost uh, in terms of um, contributions to to societies, and I think that that's very much something at work today. Uh, I gave a talk at the National Federation of Cooperative Housing uh, last weekend, and one of the things that I was um, that emerged from that talk was the fact that we are so shaped and formed by the circumstances of our birth. And this is something that some people don't even think about. Um, they have the privilege not to, to really engage with that. But I think it really is an impossibility when you come from, or it starts to feel like one anyway, uh, when you come from, uh, you know, say a very disadvantaged neighborhood, the idea of, of getting out of that and rising above that. And, and, and you see this, people who sort of get accepted to very fancy schools and then when they return home they it, it's very hard to break out of that and and this is something where and we really need to have more initiatives in place to uh, support uh, 
you know, people from sort of more disadvantaged places, but also to, we have a, a real responsibility to address income inequality and, and class inequality. These are things that are, are shaping and, and in some cases ruining uh, young lives. It struck me that this book would be such great required high school reading like that it belongs on the curriculum, right, for high school reading, because it would provoke so many questions and encourage people to feel and think and do those things, and for us too. So um, I still can't decide after all this time whether the ending was satisfying or not. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Um, as they both go off, titch and, and wash, you know, having reunited mm, somewhat, you know, watching each other, um, and then they just go off into their own place. So where are they now? <laughs> I didn't want it to end, um, even though I understood what you were trying to do, and of course there was a full story that was already told. But what would you imagine? You know, I get this a lot. Oh, really? That, that people okay. feel like... <laughs> You know, I get asked a lot if there's going to be a sequel, <laughs> which there, there isn't. Okay. Right? <laughs> but uh, I felt like it had to have this quality of, of um, unresolvedness to it. I mean, how do you resolve such a story? How do you, how do you, um, how do you resolve a friendship in which it's, it's just, there's, there's nothing, uh, there's no way of them for them to to meet and and discuss things and and come to a consensus of the history of that friendship. I mean, one person has a certain view of it. Like Titch has a view of it that he felt that he always treated Washington like he was family, and he doesn't understand his disgruntlement and and. But he doesn't really answer the question of you know, did you see me as your equal? He doesn't really directly answer that question, and I think it's because they both know that. He didn't. Uh, I, I think Titch knows that deep down, but he's, because he sees himself as having been um, a great abolitionist and, and, um, and somebody who's very interested in, in uplifting black lives, it's hard for him to, to express that he doesn't actually see that a black man could be his equal. Uh, and so I think without, I think even if he had said, you know, no, I didn't see you as my equal. I don't think that would resolve things right. either. That's, that's only kind of causing more pain. And so I feel like it had to have this sense of, of um, Washington sort of leaving that relationship behind and realizing that he's never going to have an answer uh, surrounding um, this major uh, question of his origins. Right. Um, as the world is, seems so endlessly unable to resolve this, yeah, I mean, it feels like today we're still prosecuting or defending or exploring these very same issues. Yes, right? absolutely. So I yeah. guess the story, we, we have to write it before someone can imagine it. Um, my voice is going to only hold up so long and you probably can't hear, listen to it anymore. Can I throw this open to a couple of questions from the audience? Yes. Do we have a mic for the... No, I, I didn't um, speak to anybody who had been a slave owner or had a, a slaving family in the, the past. That wasn't part of my research, unfortunately. Yeah. It's such an interesting question because so many writers that I've spoken to over the years say, you must write what you know, but then you do get beautiful literature that comes even out of not knowing, so, yeah. Yeah, or or you do know, but the ways in which you know aren't so direct. Like right. they're, you're reading voraciously, and you're looking at old documents online, and, and you're um, experiencing the story that way, uh, even though you would sort of don't have it directly from somebody's personal history. I think there's one over here. Mary? Uh, oh, okay, sure. Yeah, so the question was about um, why I 
I felt I had to keep rewriting the ending and, um, and what was it that was preventing me from getting it right? And I would say it was the sense of having to resolve all of the material. So, so many of those endings felt really pat or they felt really like I was trying to tie up all of the, the strings and it, it felt a little bit artificial. And I recognized um, what we were discussing earlier, that this was something, the relationship was something that couldn't be resolved, uh, where, you know, they're not going to get together and um, have this, recreate their, their great intimacy that they had, you know, several years ago, that Washington had to realize that he was never going to get an answer about uh, why he had been chosen by Titch. Uh, and then he had to understand that him striving to get that answer had in some sense derailed his life because he had, you know, he'd gone through, gone through things with this, this sense of, um, of uh, I guess, rootlessness and this sense of there being something unresolved. And so he was constantly moving and switching locations. And I mean, he travels to so many places in this novel, but he feels uneasy or like, the question of his origins hasn't been solved for him. And then when he gets to the end, he realizes that he has to kind of live with that, that, um, you know, that sense that things aren't going to be patly tied up for him and that he can begin to create um, the life of the free man that, that um, you know, that, that's available to him. Um, the whole novel becomes uh, an exploration of his his freedom. So the freedom that, uh, because when he was younger, he was told that freedom was just, it's bodily freedom and it's the freedom to um, not work if you don't feel like working. And it's the freedom not to answer questions if you don't feel like answering questions. And it's very simplistic, this idea uh, of freedom that he has when he goes out into the world. And so he's, I think, very shocked to discover that that freedom is so much more than that, uh, and also less than that, and and you know the freedom to to allow yourself to love is is a huge one. I think as a slave, when you know you come from a place where people were constantly being taken from you, and so you obviously there would be this emotional um, stanching that happens where you don't want to feel that you're getting too attached to somebody because their lives are so tenuous. And so for him to allow himself to love is one of the, the greatest freedoms that he understands that it's within his grasp uh, to have that. And that's really one of the major uh, themes of the novel, I'd say. And Tana, it, by the way, is a beautiful little character in the story who he has a love affair with. Yes. Yeah, so the question is about Big Kit, uh, who's his mother figure, who I, when I did the reading, um, that was a description of her. And um, yeah, again, it's that kind of a relationship where he has never had a, a mother figure uh, before he encounters her when he's about four or five years old. And she's this revelation for him. And he has these first stirrings of love, but she, she protects him and she's invested in him, but she's also very much like at an arm's length. And she's almost at times cruel to him. And part of what she's doing is she's not wanting him to get too attached to her because she understands this tenuousness of, of their lives and their relationship. And she understands that mm -hmm. there will come a point in time in, in their lives where they will be separated, uh, that there is no way that they'll be allowed to remain together. And so she's, you know, one of the lessons that she's imparting to him uh, through her cruelty is this this idea that you don't you don't feel love too deeply uh, because then you will be undone. Uh, and so it's this it's this really poignant relationship that they have where she is one of his first experiences of love, uh, but that it's tenuous. it's it's tenuous and and it does come to an end. 
Okay, we can do two more. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> okay, so my parents, I'll answer all of it really quickly. Uh, my parents are from Ghana, so they're Ghanaian immigrants who came, they met in San Francisco and then moved to um, Alberta, uh, where I was born. And I don't know, when I was growing up, I didn't really have a sense of, of black Canadian writing as, as a genre. Like, I was asked by a journalist recently to name, you know, 10 black female Canadian writers who had influenced me and you know, sort of got to number four and then thought, what, well, you know, I, I don't really have that list. So, uh, you know, I found that, I guess I wasn't really thinking that writing was something that was available uh, to somebody like me, first of all, or that, you know, I could make a contribution to, to Canadian literature. This wasn't even something that was on my radar. But I was a huge reader and uh, I enjoyed writing. Um, I started writing poetry, uh, which was very bad, and uh, I hope nobody ever gets their hands on it. I've got to make sure I tear it all up. Um, but I always really felt like I could be a writer, like this was something that, um, you know, I, f I felt that I did have these stories to tell, uh, and then eventually um, an English teacher kind of pushed me towards studying at the University of Victoria, uh, which had a very strong writing program. And I was astonished to discover that you could actually get a degree in writing. Like, it, it, seemed, it seemed strange. But, um, so I convinced my parents that this is where I should be uh, by telling them that I was uh, going to study journalism, actually, that this was going to be something. And my mother thought, oh, that's great, because you can make a good living as a journalist. Uh, she would have been very surprised to see the climate now. Um, but then I, I went into creative writing and took it from there. Are your parents living? My father is, is living. Yeah, my mother passed away about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one more only. Thank you. Oh. It's running a little fast. Oh. So we have actually probably two questions two more. or three more. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the, the character that I identified with the most was Washington. Um, I, and probably out of all of the characters that I've written, I feel most akin to him. Um, with this sense of rootlessness that he had, um, I feel like I spent so many years wandering uh, in my 20s. I lived, um, for about eight years, I lived all around Europe. I just went from country to country. I was in, spent the most of my time in Germany. I had a fellowship there, and then I, I lived in Belgium, and I was in Iceland, and I just sort of, you know, went all around. And I think I was convinced that I wasn't, you know, my, my Canadianness was suspect to me somehow. I just thought, I, you know, I don't quite feel like this is right. Uh, but, you know, the more I went out into the world, the more I realized that I was profoundly Canadian, and, <laughs> and this was very much brought home to me. And so uh, when I look at Washington and all of the places in which he's trying to um, get a foothold uh, and establish a life for himself, but that these lives feel unsatisfactory to him, I, I really feel like this reflects uh, something that was going on with me. Yes, yes. If I'm sitting here quietly, it's because I'm thinking, how do, how do I do this without spoilers? <laughs> um, <laughs> no. um, yeah, there is a bit of mysticism there. There is, and, and when Titch is asked very directly about it, you know, where did you go? Like, give me a very specific, concrete answer. 
uh, again, it's it's mysticism. He he kind of gives this very sort of spiritual answer, and it's interesting because he started out uh, in the initial pages of the novel. He's a man of reason, and there's a point after Washington's accident uh, where Washington, when he wakes up, he thinks that he has been. Um, because the slaves believe that when you die, uh, you wake up in your homeland. Uh, and so he thinks that he's been taken to Big Kid's homeland, that he's, he's woken up in Africa, that he's in Dahomey. And Titch totally disabuses him of this, like immediately. He says, that's a bit of, you know, that's, that's crazy. Like, why could you even think this? Like, no, when you die, you're dead and there's nothing. And he imparts this as though this is going to be of some comfort to Washington, but it completely uh, crushes him and, and takes him aback. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, he's very, very much a man of, of reason, and Washington is in this place of, of um, spirituality. And then when we come to the end of the novel, we almost find that they have switched, that Washington, when he gets this answer uh, that you know, relies so heavily on spirituality from Titch about where he's gone, he really rejects that. He thinks that, he, you know, that Titch is just trying to um, avoid telling him, you know, the actual truth. But Titch really is in this place of mysticism. He has become a bit of a mystic. And, and that inversion was very deliberate. Okay. La really last. <laughs> Mm -hmm. why, why did you do that? <coughs> yeah, so... The balloon. There's, yes, there's a, a balloon accident in, and uh, the hydrogen becomes unstable and, and uh, explodes in Washington's face and then he's got this scar. And, you know, when I was initially writing the novel, that was one of those things that came um, not in the first draft but a little bit later. And it seemed to me... Uh, I think one of the things that Titch says about it is, almost flippantly, he says, oh, you've been marked by science now. And, and it's kind of, um, it's quite brutal. It, 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 you know, it's, it's very psychologically um, difficult to, to, to bear. But I, I really liked that, or not liked, but I, I thought it would be interesting if when Washington goes out into the world, I mean, he's, he's a black man, and when he goes into largely white societies, um, you know, he will be largely unaccepted in these places that he goes. But when he gets to Nova Scotia and he's entering societies in which, you know, they're more um, largely black societies, he's still not accepted. There's a scene in the, the bar uh, where he's confronted by these two men who come up and they're just saying how disgusted they are by his... Um, his physiognomy, and and you realize then that not only can he not find acceptance in these largely white societies, that there's this sort of um, double estrangement taking place because he won't be accepted in these largely black societies due to his disfigurement, which one of the men expresses, you know, that obviously you're, like, you're a slave because this looks like a slave's markings. Essie, thanks for the book, and as I look at you, I think thanks for being young enough that we know there will be many more books to come. <laughs>